It's 4 o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means, don't you? It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Yeah, baby. <laughs> uh, the audience loves you. And my guest today, my very special guest, is Miss Stephanie Reed. She is a music licensing executive, um, has become a good friend over the last couple of years, and if I dare say... Uh, I know you don't know that I'm going to say this. One of the smartest people I've met in the music industry, and I've been in the industry for more years than I'd like to count. I mean, decades. Very, very bright lady. And she and I and her boss, actually, were, were in a conversation one day talking about um, AI. Everybody's, like, freaking out about AI. And there's good reason to be apprehensive, Uh at least I thought so until I talked to Steph. Um, and we also got into blockchain for music publishing and music licensing. And I just, I, I got off of that thing and went, wow, it, it's extremely rare that I have a hard time like keeping up with a conversation. But she was so knowledgeable and so articulate about this. I said to myself, self, you got to have her on Taxi TV. So here we are. So welcome, Steph. I'm really yeah. Uh, I'm so glad you could join me and join us. Um, and by the way, for everybody watching, um, I am not in the office today. We're doing, we're pre-recording this as if it's a live episode. I keep looking over there at the cameras there. Uh, like I've never done this before. Anyway, um, it's like a live show, except you guys are going to see a, a broadcast of this tape session, but the chat room will be live. So there you go. So I didn't even write questions for this because, frankly, I, I, I mean, the questions I would have asked would have been more rudimentary than what you would normally talk about. So should, let me just start by asking, should people be scared to death that AI is going to steal their music creating job? No, absolutely not. <laughs> okay. Well, it's been great having you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be part of. No, I think that the fear of AI is understandable uh, from any job perspective because it's unknown, it's fairly new, and when we don't really understand something's potential or how it works, it's natural and instinctive to be apprehensive and fearful of it. That being said, what AI is capable of doing is not completely replacing you because AI has not become, at this stage of the game, a sentient autonomous being. It's a tool that anyone can use to their advantage to help them be their best self. From a music perspective, AI is capable of helping you. It's not capable of replacing you. Because- Isn't the fear that it will someday? Yes, but I, that day is so far away that you have an AI in a form that can actually trick someone into thinking that it's a real human being with your experiences, your insights, your creative capacity, that's in the, you know, Star Trek level distant future. It's not anywhere near that. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of my go-to examples to use is if you've ever used um, something like ChatGPT or any of the new and upcoming uh, text-based and language-based AI models and ask it to write lyrics, you'll <laughs> probably be a lot more confident that you're not in danger of being replaced simply because part of music is the, I would say the core component of music is that it's a language that we use to communicate with each other. And when you don't have human experience, the best you can do is aggregate and imitate and come up with something I'm speaking that in AI, the best that it can do is try to sort of make something that's like this other stuff. Okay. But it 
can't actually tell that story that you can tell because it hasn't lived the human experience. It's not good at writing lyrics. It's not even that great. It's not great at imitating lyrics that have already been written. I mean, it says some really goofy and out there stuff because it's not a human being with a human connection to other humans and other animals and the world around it. And so it doesn't see through your eyes. It doesn't live your life. It doesn't feel your feelings. And that's so much of what goes into music that the fear that um, a computer program can do that better than you, I think is misplaced when you really think about it. I would agree. I've used ChatGPT quite a bit. I use it as a tool, not as a full-on creation tool. But um, for instance, when I edit the taxi members' success stories every month, it's really laborious. It takes me half a Sunday to do nine of those success stories because people send in 500 word things that are written like a text message with <laughs> no punctuation or very little punctuation or incorrect punctuation. Not that I'm going to win any English contest. My teachers all hated me, but I, I know where a comma goes and I know where a colon goes. So people write stuff, people tend to write stuff like with lots of ellipses, you know, uh, and then I started creating music, dot, 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 dot. And then I thought about doing instrumental music only, dot, dot, dot. And we'll literally do 500 words that. So I use ChatGPT by taking their raw thing, dumping it into ChatGPT and saying, um, edit for cohesiveness, punctuation, spelling, and make it conversational. And what I get back is about 85% right. So then it's editable. And, mm -hmm. and I can go back and make sure it's actually telling the truth because ChatGPT does lie like a rug. I mean, I, I've caught it so many lies, more lies than my first wife, actually. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, gosh, I hope Karen's not watching. Um, <laughs> anyway, no. We get along just fine now. Um, it does lie. ChatGPT will make stuff up. I once asked it to show me favorable reviews of taxi.com. And it gave me reviews from people I know that absolutely don't like taxi and have never said anything nice about us ever. And it, so it, what it's doing is reaching out to the internet, grabbing a name going, okay, I'll take Bob Smith and make him say that. And it was all lies, lies, I tell you. But I agree with everything you said, but that was all lyric-based stuff, the human experience. What about instrumental music? Um, I've heard a couple of instrumental things where I went, wow, that's pretty close. Not great, but closer than I might have expected. Um, and certainly if I were a composer, I would use it kind of like a tool, like I'm using ChatGPT for editing that stuff. If I were an instrumental composer, I might say, um, suggest another pad that works with what I've already laid down to see what it would come up with. I don't know that I would say, can you create two minutes and 15 seconds of an instrumental cue German polka and see what comes out, you know? <laughs> So yeah, uh, can you differentiate between lyrics and instrumental? Yes, and so the it, I think the lyrics are the easiest one to to set apart because lyrics are language based. It's a very human communication mechanism. Not that sound isn't in general, but I think there's a, a component of that in the instrumentation as well. And what we're perhaps glossing over too soon, is that this is still all based on human input. You still right. have to tell the machine and then help the machine learn what to do. And you have to be good at writing prompts. You, you, you right. can't succeed on your first try. You should actually like take a semester of prompt writing. Exactly. And it, it, it even highlights the multitudinous ways that language can be interpreted. So you're using verbal language, text-based language to tell a program what to output to you sonically. And then you have to feed back into it. Well, that's still a lot of human 
interaction. This is AI functioning mostly as um, almost like an instrument would. You're learning how to play AI to an extent. And to like an instrument, garbage in, garbage out. Garbage in, garbage out. So can you set a very simple prompt and have AI create something, generate something? Well, yeah, but it can't do everything. It's not a complete, a, a, AI is not going to play the cello. It's not going to base its music on its instrumental music on how you felt that day you went this place and saw this person without you. You are still a key to that AI's creation, whether it's instrumental or lyrical or both. That's a great so point uh, and particularly applicable to our end of the industry, licensing music for emotion. Uh, largely based on emotion because you want to amplify or underscore an emotion in a scene. So you're right. It, it may play a pad. Can it play a pad with that extra special little bit of sorrow in there? Maybe not. Probably not. Probably not without a lot of feedback from you or yeah. someone to go, mm, no. Ah, yes. But again, it's, it's basing all of this on your input. It's learning from you. It's becoming an extension of you, just like a keyboard or a guitar or flute or whatever the case may be. So to be afraid that a computer program can completely replace you, I think is rooted in a lack of understanding of its current capability and perhaps an undervaluing of yourself. <laughs> Gee, no humans I know have ever done that. Right? Um, <laughs> Musicians, insecure artists. Well, they now have a service where you can get an AI shrink uh, online to do a little analysis. Actually, I think Cedar Sinai is offering AI psychiatry or something. Sigmund Freud is definitely rolling over in his grave right now. <laughs> but he was a. Uh... <laughs> He was a loose kid. He was a, a crazy <laughs> genius, a loose cannon. <laughs> Aren't they all? Aren't they all? So, okay, um, let's keep going down that road. In maybe it'd be valuable as a tool for uh, we're doing a harmony stack, and I've already done the harmony stack, uh, but I'd like to hear it with a ninth in there somewhere. So you could hypothetically just say, take this harmony stack and uh, give me a ninth in the stack. That would be exactly a cool way to use it, I guess. And I, I think that it using it as sort of your creative assistant, like you're describing, uh, try this a little different. Try this here, try that there. Okay, mute this line. I think using it as uh, something that makes your repetitive tasks and your difficult tasks like editing a big huge block of text mm -hmm. is where it's going to see the most use and really serve its best purpose at least in the near future you know the next 50 years by the time ai can completely imitate you we'll be long dead i'd like to see it advance faster like all technology but it, it doesn't. So using it to help you is definitely the way to go rather than being too afraid of it to want to touch it at all. Um, I'm trying to think of, I'm going to bring it back to the realm, take it out of creation for a moment and go to the realm of music licensing. So um, there are, TV networks that won't use any music from a catalog that they haven't sanctioned as a usable catalog is a legit one stop where all the ducks are in a row mm -hmm. and they know it's not going to rain problems down on them when a piece of music gets put into a show and then airs and it's like, oh no, there were 27 co-writers, but only one listed, blah, blah, blah. Oh, you know, all those problems that can happen. Mm -hmm. Are you experiencing them, experience them on a daily basis? So Indeed. I'm 
you can't copyright. I think everybody knows this, but I'm going to say it out loud anyway. You can't copyright something not created by a human, at least under American copyright law. I'm not sure how that plays in other countries. So if that's the case, then the concern that people have that AI is going to take over their jobs creating music for film and television, I think that's another reason they don't have to worry as deeply or as quickly as they are because there are these copyright issues that, okay, let's say it made perfect music right now today, the networks aren't going to use it because they don't have their legal ducks in a row um, to use music that is not copyrighted. And then there are the PROs that, you know, that's a whole other thing that we'll probably get into deeper on, on the blockchain discussion. But mm. um, yeah, where where did the PRO... So let's go back to copyright rather than scattering all over the place right now. Copyright, what's your feeling? Because you deal with TV networks all the time. You know these people well. You know their rules and regulations well. How will they, if ever, adapt to the fact that something created by AI can't be copyrighted that under their current way of working, they could never use that music. Am I correct in making that statement? Uh, in many cases, uh, yes, because it's, uh, because it's in this sort of nebulous gray area where the most recent uh, court cases and rulings about it are, no, this was generated by AI that doesn't count and to, to boil it down well if it doesn't count as an original work of authorship then the benefit is you don't have to pay for it to, potentially but you also can't make any money off of it so well, certainly the creator can't make any money off of it, but what about the network is making money by not spending money to license or to pay any performance royalties through a PRO, aren't they? To an extent, yeah. But now you have content and arranged in such a way that part of what you have synchronized isn't copyrightable. So you don't have any, any ability to say, we use this music in this scene, in these progressions, and that compilation, that assembly of picture and music together constitutes its own copyrightable right. work. Except now anybody can oh, use wow. music because it's, royal, it's royalty free, it's AI generated, it's not protected by copyright. Now you don't have something that's... Hmm potentially original and unique you have something that anybody can emulate very closely i mean they could use the exact music and the exact sequences and the exact they would have to alter pictures but do you see this also what i mean by it's, it's sort of a double-edged sword yeah in that regard so yeah you save a buck up front but you also don't have um as valuable of a product afterwards and what about direct licensing? Um, do you want to give a definition of what direct licensing is uh, as opposed to going through a PRO for people who may not be familiar with how that works? So in the direct licensing scenario, you are, as a rights holder, allowing someone to use your copyrighted material, your intellectual property, well, music, and pay you an upfront fee with the understanding that they are not paying any licensing fees to performing rights organizations. Ergo, that's the only money you're going to see from it based on the terms of your agreement. You're not going to get royalties down the road every time this is performed publicly, every time it's copied or distributed because you made some sort of other agreement with the licensee directly so that's really the main difference you've gone outside of the um established organizations that are responsible for tracking and monitoring and collecting the various royalties that come from the different rights of copyright and said we're going to do this over here and that's totally fine and it does happen and it can be worth it in certain scenarios but i mean 
you want to make sure that in a direct licensing scenario, you have a very thorough and deep understanding of the terms of the agreement, or you can potentially cut yourself off from the long-term revenue streams that you're... Well, and also it opens the door wide. I got a call, I think I uh, told your your cohort this uh, in a private conversation, but I'm not gonna mention any network names. I got a call 20 some, maybe 25 years ago from one of the three or four major networks saying, we've been watching your company for a while. You guys are perfectly positioned to create a giant catalog of music for us that we would then direct license. And we would no longer, so this was a three letter network that wanted to use no licensed music from any libraries, anything that went through any of the PROs. Um, and I said, wow, as cool as that sounds to be the one entity that supplies all the music for everything on your shows, which sounded a little far-fetched. Um, but I could see what they were saying is, you know, Taxi has a wide reach. So right. potentially, and for an ongoing period of time, we could be finding music from all over the world, but it would all be direct license, which means no back end through PRO, there is a, a very dark element to that. Some musicians would look at that and say, well, great, they're going to give me $250 to use 12 seconds of it on a reality show. Awesome. I get money up front. I don't have to wait a year to get the money from my PRO. And But you know what? Now they've got you where they want you. And even though they paid you 250 bucks this time, now they control it and they could say, all right, we'd like to use your music again next year, but we're only paying half of that. And a year later, only half of the half. So they really control the price and there is no back end. So ultimately you've signed your own death warrant by wanting to grab that brass ring, which is right in front of your face. Is that, am yes. I understanding that correctly? Did I? Yes, you okay. nailed it. You nailed it. That is the downside and the dark side. And it's, Best to always exercise caution when a party that has apparently more leverage and more power is offering you something that sounds too good to be true or better than than it is in actuality. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, without assigning deep, dark evil to every uh powerful company or entity out there it is a business and the point of their business is to make them money not to make musicians money. yeah <laughs> they'll let you make as much as much money as they have to mm -hmm. but and that's up to you if you accept 250 you've agreed to the limit You've agreed to the value. And and you may hold out for 500, but there's somebody standing in line right behind you that can't make their rent this month or has a big car repair. They're going to take the 250 and now they've set the limit that you're going to have to live with. There's always that. That's true. And that's a decision that only a creator can make for themselves. <sighs> it's so hard being a grown up. Um, Oh, and it's a it's a trap. Never should have grown up. <laughs> my my light is freaking out. I'm just gonna live with that rather than try and do a repair while we're on camera. I did this earlier. It like started going darker and brighter, darker and brighter, and then like a minute later it went back to bright. So we're good. Okay. Um, <laughs> goes to the machine. Um, any other thoughts about AI that, I mean, you are a musician um, and a music licensing expert, so you've got a pretty wide palette to form opinions from. Any other stuff, from the musician perspective, um, have any suggestions on how they could start using what does work in AI today to make them faster or better at producing music? Yes. Yeah, so what I would tell every musician out there is take a sort of personal creative inventory and go, where do I drop the ball? What's the most time consuming thing? What's the most annoying thing? What part of this whole process am I the least adept at, or do I absolutely enjoy the least and put off? 
I mean, for me, it's going beyond a lead sheet. Uh, I mean, yes, I got a music degree, but writing things down notation wise, it's time consuming and it's not the fun part. It's yeah. the, you, ha you know, it's the after the fact, okay, let's get this down on paper. So for me, if I'm looking for ways to incorporate AI into my process, it's to try out the platforms that transcribe that mm -hmm. can interpret that you can feed back into and go, no, don't notate this like this, use this style, use, um, use jazz chord notation, use classical voicing here, you know, whatever it is that you find the most challenging time consuming or think, man, this would be, I'd be a lot more productive if this part was faster and then find the AI tool tools, plural, the market is it's, it's startup time. Every, every day there's a new, oh, try this person's, try this company's latest, specifically music related AI platform and see if it works. See if it actually works for you. Try yeah. all of them. If there's 10 that supposedly help in the area that you want a, an assistant in, try them all and then integrate them into your routine to actually help you do something better. You mentioned, you know, trying your, uh, coming from the engineering standpoint, find the tools that can analyze your, that can plug into your, to your DAW and give you feedback or help you try something faster without, you know, a repetitive process of, okay, duplicate this. Okay, no, undo, undo. Yeah, there's software out there for mac, ma, uh, matching the general tone of somebody else's mix, the proportion of bass versus mid-range and treble, blah, mm. blah, blah. So you could, you know, uh, for level matching and other forms of sonic matching. And from what people tell me, it, it works quite well. Um, I've got to think AI mastering is probably something... Again, having the ears of, I've worked with some incredibly good mastering engineers that are artists at what they do. Will AI ever be able to equal them? I don't know. But for somebody who's doing 11 pieces of instrumental music uh, to contribute to a catalog of a music library, and the library says, hey, you know, would you mind mastering, give this a little light mastering before it gets to us, just to get your levels and blah, 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 in a row. I would think that that would be a productive use um, because mastering is generally not fun. After you've done it on two or three songs, it's like, oh, missing a football game, you know? Um, and then that, I mean, that's something I've never actually done myself. That's always passed to someone else. Right. <laughs> you know, because that's its own, like you said, it's its own, it's its own skill set. You know, not everybody plays piano. Not everybody can master well. And Ooh. So, oh, go ahead. Sorry. You know, like, I'm make, making a note so I don't forget this. So like you were saying, when you need to do something, especially where time is of the essence, this is, this is an area where AI has a speed. It can do things faster. It can certain things, not everything. So if it takes you two hours of just making up a number to master those 11 tracks the way this library is asked for them mm -hmm. and it takes your ai assistant 10 minutes well you've just added the time value back to your back to your whole life yeah. <laughs> you didn't spend doing a non creative component that that was just a repetitive sort of make all this yeah. Like and, and you can again going back to input you know garbage in garbage out you could you should listen back to the mastered version that ai did and say to yourself absolutely pretty good um ai can you please add two more db of bottom end at 100 hertz and you know use ai to get it even closer as a tool so all right, and now let's talk about another task that I don't think anybody enjoys, especially my friends who work at music licensing companies, which is metadata. It's highly critical. Um, 
People sometimes say to me, why do libraries get half the money? Well, they don't realize, first of all, the due diligence that you guys have to do. And you could go down the road for two hours on a single piece of music and then get met with, oh, you didn't tell me there were three other writers on this and two of them have passed away. You don't know who's got control of their estates. There are those issues, but that's a whole different conversation. Um, but metadata, uh, you know, they, they obviously want to know the song title, the, the splits, the contact information for the creators, um, maybe even an acknowledgement of work for hires have been, you know, or in hand and, and all tidied up. Mm -hmm. uh, but then we get down to the metadata, which is the creative side, which is what's the mood, um, what's the genre, things like that. And, and God bless musicians. They have put food on the table for the Lasco family forever. Um, and so I'm not saying this is a put down. I'm saying it is just a basic fact from my observational experiences of 49 years of being in the music industry that most people cannot be objective. What genre is this? They won't get it right 100% of the time. What mood is this? I don't know. What do you think? It's hard. I don't think I could do it any better than they do. But I'll bet you AI could get them pretty darn close. So that may be a good way to use it as a tool. Um, could you list, listen to this piece of music and list moods that could go into my metadata? my metadata it is um a burgeoning area where i see it getting better and better and not to sound douchey but still not as good as i think of myself at metadata but <laughs> but I've never trained you're you're Look, I know you well enough to know now that you are exceptional and i'm not just saying that to blow smoke it's Thank you. I, I don't think that everybody has the skill set that you have. I don't. You were born with something that a lot of us don't have. I'm not sure what it is, but I, I've seen you on panels at the Road Rally. Go, my God! The other three panelists just looked at her like and went, "Wow." <laughs> I don't know if you've ever noticed that, but they do. Um, okay, so let's assume that everybody is not as gifted as you are at getting that that nexus of music, business, and, and art form, you know, together. Um, again, let's go back to the average homebound musician with a studio. It's really good at making music, but when it comes to the business side. Right. Then I would, I would absolutely, I think part of what helps me excel in data attribution is that I love it. I love language. I like words. I like just figuring out the right combination of things to describe and to let someone else know what's going on here with this mm -hmm. piece of music. If you don't love that and you're not into it, then absolutely use an AI tool to get the basic descriptions and attributions of that, of your music out there it will save you loads of time and it will absolutely benefit you in the long run because metadata is sort of the underpinning it's the it's the fabric of the entire digital world that we live and work in now everything comes back to metadata i can't tell you it's the rare exception these days that someone doesn't include in a pitch request make sure your files have metadata which lets me know that there are even businesses that are out there that are still sometimes dropping the ball so it's not just musicians and creators who aren't necessarily you know data junkies it's that this is sort of a challenge and, and a, yet a necessary component of every aspect of the business uh, you have to know what something is you have to know who it belongs to and when you get into the subjective data, you have to know why it matters. Why do we care? Well, you care if that this is fitting a certain mood or vibe because that's the mood or vibe you need to convey in your creative content, in your movie, in your film, in your commercial, in your podcast, whatever it is. So it's value can't be overstated. I completely agree with everything you just said. I think that's a 
great observation and, a, and as always, a very articulate description. Um, if I owned a music library, I, I probably spend more time to listening, more time listening to multiple music libraries than maybe any other person on earth because they're my clients and I want to know. I mean, sometimes I'll go listen to somebody's catalog and, and, and take note of the fact that their orchestral stuff sounds dated. Um, it only sounds dated because it was recorded seven years ago in libraries, sound libraries weren't, sample libraries weren't as good back then seven years ago as they are today. So the piece was well composed, but you can tell that. You can. So I will pick up the phone and call that library owner because they're all friends of mine and say, by the way, I hope you don't take offense by me letting you know this, but I was listening to your catalog trying to see where you guys might have some holes that we could fill in for you. And I noticed that your orchestral stuff sounded dated because some of the samples were old. Would you like me to run some listings to get you a fresher look at orchestral? And they go, wow, thank you for doing that. So something I've noticed, sorry for the long run up to that, but something I've noticed in doing that, um, it's how I spend my weekends, um, is that a lot of the descriptors for their music are not very accurate and it didn't they didn't have to be 10 years ago um, they didn't have to be as accurate five years ago Their, things are always getting better and moving forward but because catalogs grow and nobody wants to do the job of going back into a catalog and re-tagging everything or rewriting descriptors ai would make a great tool for that ai go revisit every piece of music in my catalog and yeah. Show me everything in red that you don't think is accurate for describing this track. That would be a fun exercise. And it's funny you mentioned that because that is something that um, we plan to try. Uh, we have been, this has sort of been my, my, my baby, my metadata baby, reworking the metadata structure of our whole system. Right. And it was to address the components you just were bringing up. Accuracy, how do you um, account for something that says orchestral but doesn't tell you it's orchestral but it has synth strings. And you can tell that they're synth strings and that they weren't actually, you know, he didn't actually have an orchestra in the studio. And we want to separate that from things that can fool me or my boss. You know, that's the sort of the rubric. Can it yeah. fool a musician? Can it fool an expert into thinking, yeah, I can't tell the difference between this sample and someone who's actually playing a violin or a tuba or a French horn or whatever it is. Um, and so being able to teach, to give an AI input and go, okay, now that I have this new structure, now that we have this new structure, go back through 8,000 things mm -hmm. <laughs> and find where the structure isn't applied where it's and where it's not applied well and speed up that process because otherwise you have to do it manually and that takes just a lot of time and it's it got to be somebody time. that knows what you can't hire interns to do that mm -hmm. um no, you, you need ears and experience to do that um and wow. there is, I mean, there is one of the first things I did when we were looking at restructuring and advancing our metadata system was to draw a line between objective data and subjective data. And objective data doesn't evolve. These people wrote the song, it's in this key. <laughs> There's this many beats per minute based on this time signature and tempo marking, and that's objective. That's not going to change. What someone calls a certain subgenre, that could change. Uh, the words and language that we use to describe moods and feelings and vibes, that can change. You can mm -hmm. have um, a different take on a lyric theme because poetry can be read different ways by different people. So AI can be especially useful when you need to constantly evolve and adapt 
and doing so requires vast amounts of manual hands-on time to complete. It's not, if you tell AI, if you give it a task, it can execute it in, you know, as fast as information can travel, which is, you know, as, as close to the speed of light as we can get. For me to go do it, even thinking of myself very fancily as an expert, <laughs> you know, it's still going to take me a hundred years. <laughs> right. And you'll never see another episode of Succession or whatever is your favorite TV show at the time. I'll just be, I'll just be in a dark office plugging away, trying to find all of these terms I need to replace or instances of where I need to add something new. So it, it would be virtually impossible to train a team of people to do that. I mean, there's some things, you know, I mean, eventually you could five years of doing nothing but training, you could make them right. all that level of expert, but who's got five years? Who's got five years and the, yeah, the time and the capital to invest in that. But by, by the time you get them trained to where you wanted them to be when you started, well, now we're five right. years on the road <laughs> and we've got a whole new set right. of things we need to address and adapt to. Oh, we don't use that genre term anymore. We use this one because nobody, you know, says that. That's not the, the preferred nomenclature. So you got to use AI. You have to look at technology instead of as a threat, as a tool. As a, it, That's why we invented it in the first place. Technology was animals figuring out, oh, there's an easier way to do this and I can save myself some time to do the other stuff I want to do if I use this tool. I saw a thing on TV last night. Uh, it was actually on Twitter posted by Elon Musk, who is both a proponent and scared to death of AI. You know, it, I, I like Elon. A lot of people don't. I personally think he ranges between absolutely brilliant and hysterically funny. And sometimes, yes, he, he may offend people. But so he said, you know, some years ago, I had the uh, he had the idea to start a school because he thinks the education system in America is failing miserably. Um, so he wants to start the Texas Institute of Technology and Science. Think about what the shirt would say. Technology Institute. <laughs> and I couldn't tell if he was kidding or if he understood that the, that the acronym was hysterically funny. The acronym was, that's it, because he, uh, he cracks me up. I mean, he's a, he's wacko. I have a love-hate relationship with Eli because sometimes he says stuff and I'm like, okay, you're done. Sit down. <laughs> <laughs> Go home, Elon, you're drunk. <laughs> <laughs> he, he or stone he but, is always entertaining but he is brilliant entertaining and he is brilliant and he's uh you know he's not risk averse which i <laughs> which i like it's yeah. people that see risk and go yeah so what we're gonna do it anyway and that that care capable of making huge paradigm shifting changes right and, and you can't make a change like that without risking everything sometimes it's like you got to be willing to cross the rubicon, the rubicon to know what's on the other side and he'll do it but he can afford to do it but he made all that money good for him and he did it by you know taking big risks yeah absolutely god bless him but yeah I, I, if that school is a real thing i'm going to be the first guy to order the shirt and i can't uh, wait to wear it out in public and see how far out the door my wife lets me go before she yanks the leash and pulls me back in. Change your clothes, damn it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, um, anything else you'd like to add to the AI discussion before we move on to blockchain, which AI, I've got a, a decent grip on blockchain. I mean, I, know, I could tell you what it is, but I don't understand it like you do. So any, any other AI thoughts before we wrap that segment of today's show up? I think we hit the biggest, most salient components. So I think we're we're good to move on to the block. Okay. All right. Blockchain. Um, I'm going to let Steph explain it because she will do it in a more cogent manner than I probably would. You know, 
three years ago, five years ago, everybody was saying, oh, crypto, it's blockchain, it's totally safe, can't be hacked. People have hacked it. So I do want to remember, I'm just writing the word hack down so we can talk about that later. Um, but yeah, go ahead and explain blockchain and then let's talk about how you envision blockchain benefiting the music industry and how that should probably scare the crap out of the PROs. <laughs> Uh, well, and if they're smart, they'll adopt it rather than repel from it because that's what creates the ability for someone to take you over. Absolutely. Make, make friends with blockchain and then you don't have to worry about it. So blockchain, I think, is most typically associated with cryptocurrency. And that's one of an infinite number of possible ways that blockchain computing can be used. And essentially what it is, and I will say that I am not a computer scientist. I just find technology interesting. And so I pushed through my first um, encounters of, okay, wait, what? What is this? What does this do? And what does it mean? And then it clicked. It, you don't have to be uh, a coding expert or a computer frameworks expert to actually have a comfortable understanding of blockchain. And it's a ledger system and computing architecture that... explain what a ledger system is because not everybody took accounting in high school <laughs> <laughs> so you can think of a ledger i'm looking around for a notebook to grab as um i'll just we'll just use this handy dandy legal pad so a ledger is simply something where you where you record that something happened that a transaction took place okay so like your bank statement is a form bank of a ledger exactly okay. it's it's a record. It's just essentially just a record of what's happening between whom and any other import, any other metadata, any other important information about that occurrence and the people who were involved in it. And so the benefits of blockchain is that it's, it's based on uh, a decentralized computing network. And what that means is that the information about the blockchain and what's going on on it isn't controlled by a single entity. In fact, to record anything on this blockchain, to operate on it, with it, through it, all of the computers, all of the systems, all the nodes on this network have to agree. Consensus algorithms are what um, secures blockchain. And when you hear of it being um, unhackable, it is as close to unhackable as is possible. And that's because rather than imagine if you're robbing a bank, if all of the money is in this one vault, and there's one code to this vault. Once you get through that one code, you can get all that money. But if you wanted to rob that bank and in order to get the money out of the vault, you had to be in the place of a thousand other banks across the world. Well, now you, now you can't get in. You're one person. So it's not like having a million dollar gold bar sitting in the vault of one Wells Fargo. It's like having one ten thousandth slice of that gold bar in 10,000 Wells Fargo's. And you would have to know the key code to every one of those vault doors at all 10,000 of them. Exactly. Okay. And Wells Fargo wouldn't have your key code. If you're the owner and I'm trying to steal your money, I'm trying to get your 10,000 gold bars. I don't, I would need yours, your code, and only you have that code. See, that would be risky with me because just last night around midnight, I realized I lost my checkbook. I've never lost my checkbook in all these years. <laughs> and it freaks me out that I can't find it in my office or anywhere in my house. So if I had, if I was the only person that had that key code, that's a problem because there have been incidents where people have had something very valuable in blockchain and then they lost the fob that had the code, right? That is the downside. That's the other side of using wow. 
decentralized computing and blockchain is that it, w it will remove everybody else who can possibly help you. So now you're in control, but you're the only one in control. And if you lose your passcodes, your key phrases, you're, you're, that's it. Sorry. Sorry about your luck, pal. So, uh, so who gets oops, prevention on. to adoption, but it also makes it very, it also makes it secure. If every computer on a network has to validate that what's going on here is authentic activity, you've essentially shut the ability of hackers to take control. So how, who are these, let's stick with the number of 10,000 just because it makes it easier to imagine, but let's say that there are 10,000 computers that are 10,000 nodes and each one of them has one ten thousandth of the ledger. Um, are we talking my laptop and your laptop are on, are, are nodules on this system? And yeah. so if that's true and it's not, you know, like, 10,000 giant computers sitting in a Costco sized server farm. Um, right. What happens if of those 10,000 people, 2,000 of us go on vacation, decide to turn off our laptops, leave them at home, put them under the bed while we're gone, and now you've only got 8,000? Uh, does the algorithm reach out and find 2,000 other computers? Mm -hmm. to put the information on so that there's always 10,000? It does have that capability. And that that comes down to the type of blockchain, um, which particular blockchain something's built on. Okay. But um, part of the reason that, uh, for example, a cryptocurrency transaction can take a while to process is because of how long it takes to find enough computers on a network to find enough nodes to participate in running the consensus algorithms and validating the transactions. So it's not as fast as it could be, but there's also the ability for things to run in the background. So it's not just your laptop that would need to be on or specifically connected to a network. I mean, your phone, your watch, there's all kinds of devices that have computing power that can participate in the execution of a So my gold bars could be stored in my smart fridge. <laughs> <laughs> Literally or cryptographically. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. And then I'd have to call them cold bars. Woo. Oh, hold I on, can. hold on, hold on, hold on. Hey, I only do high class TV production around here. <laughs> oh, nothing but the finest. <laughs> That's right. Wow, this is okay. So, you know, I did have a, I don't know, kind of a decent understanding of blockchain, but you explain it so well that uh, you have enhanced my understanding. Thank you. So, now yeah. let's talk about why, how blockchain would benefit performance royalties in the music industry um, rather than doing it in a traditional manner like the PROs are doing it now, which is so mysterious that even the heads of those companies don't really understand how it works, I think. <laughs> yeah, there's uh, some uh, creative math that uh, is never fully publicized in how the royalties are decided and allocated and they sort of give you with you know, ask Kappa BMI a general idea of how they yeah. compute things, but you don't have you don't have full transparency. You know, they'll give you large overviews of what's going on, but not necessarily the granular details of we took in this amount of money, we calculated these royalties this way at this person. You know what I'm saying? So there's still some mystery there with um, with a blockchain based system the the core con another core concept of it is that it's transparent it's that nothing's hidden there's nothing on this blockchain that everyone can't look at and see 
and record and make note of and use the information for. Say thing, that one more time. That well, was a nothing, pretty <laughs> complex idea. There's nothing on the blockchain, on any blockchain anywhere that you don't have access to if you wanted to. If you wanted to see what was going on, you can see everything from the beginning to the end. You being the person with the passcode or anybody in the world? Anybody, anybody anywhere. They're the So because, because it's been used in dark web or shrouded activities, there's this idea that it's very secret and untraceable. That's absolutely contrary to fact. What there is is no requirement that you identify yourself with like a driver's license. I can be you know, person X, Y, Z pinging myself through a thousand proxy servers and unknown. There's no requirement that I have to be, that I have to tell you who I am. Well, what about my 10,000 pieces of gold that are sitting on, so anybody can see that Michael Lasko is 10,000 pieces, gold bars yeah. on 10,000 computers? Yeah, if you have it, crypt, if, it if it's um, crypto gold, we'll say, then yeah, I can see every, uh, I invested early in um, a decentralized platform called Stacks. Uh, they use the they call it token the Stacks. Everything I've ever done with Stacks is publicly visible and available, and it's built on the Bitcoin. They use Bitcoin blockchain architecture. But that's isn't that I've the antithesis of why we all you know, have bank accounts, let alone Swiss bank, not that I've got a Swiss bank account, but you know, I mean, people want privacy in banking. I don't want people to know that I've got 10,000 gold bars. Well, and that's why it's not necessarily something you use for everything all the time. If you actually want to keep something private, then you'd either use a private um, profile or way of accessing the blockchain or you wouldn't use blockchain for that because the whole concept of blockchain is that there's nothing secret and no one entity or centralized source controls the information. Well, I'm so glad that I've got you on this episode today because I apparently do have misconceptions about blockchain because I thought that part of the reason, I mean, people I know are using blockchain to make payments so that they're untrackable by the IRS. I don't know if that's still a thing or not. But it sounds to me like if it's visible by anybody, the IRS would be standing first in line, especially with their 87,000 new IRS agents. Um, am I, was that so, bad information I was given? No, it's not. And the, the reason that it doesn't seem transparent is because we're talking about looking at computer code language a lot of the time. So if the IRS isn't equipped with a bunch of blockchain architecture experts that are going through to access all of the different um, D5 platforms and analyze them and run, oh, is this username on the blockchain linkable to this person with this social security number who said that they didn't do any cryptocurrency transactions? So there's Yes, they can see all the information, but what, how to synthesize that information and apply it to um, a use case is a different story. And well, I know who could do it, and they could do it in five minutes. My friend Robbie the robot using his AI brain. Sounds like a perfect task for Robbie. Perfect task for Robbie. <laughs> perfect task for Robbie. I mean, that's something AI was born to do. Sort through massive amount of yeah. computer data and tell me what it means. Find a connection here. That would Boy, take we it. need to hang out more often. I feel like together we could be like the evil nemesis in a Batman movie or something. <laughs> hmm. You're like, oh, on Inspector Gadget, I'll just be <laughs> stroking my cat. <laughs> oh, man. Wow. What the, I, uh, yeah, what the go ahead. Is being absolutely foolhardy that you could mitigate fraud and embezzlement to such a degree if you met if you implemented and mandated the use of blockchain in certain contexts rather than being like we don't understand cryptocurrency ah bitcoin volatile it's like you guys got to get in the boat and row you're missing a perfect opportunity to make all of your jobs easier and more efficient i mean the whole point of the irs is to get everybody's information yeah. 
they know how much of you know your money you owe as dues to the America Club. Well, if you want to find out if somebody's not not coughing up the right amount of dues, then make everybody do everything on the blockchain. Then you have all the information right there. So I don't. Wow. I understand it, but I don't understand it. If you know what I mean, the the resistance to um, blockchain finance. It's like this is. This is well, secure. it's extremely hard to understand, except for you. Uh, and, and people, until somebody can explain it in plain English to people who don't even understand what a ledger is or what distributed computing is, all, all that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, I grew up in a farm town in Illinois, and I'm pretty sure that there are some 83-year-old farmers there that this, I mean, they're just learning how to operate their cell phones. So I can understand why they would be resistant because not only is this a learning curve and it's newfangled, but on its face, it sounds fricking scary, it does. but you make a great case for a lot of great use cases. So that's the person who's going to win is the person that can sell it in plain English so that people go, oh, that's cool. I could use that. And that's really how I learned about it was, okay, somebody, I watched a lot of things and I read a lot of things that were, okay, teach me, teach me in plain non-computer scientist language at first. And then once it starts clicking, like, okay, I, I get these, these metaphors, these sort of relational examples, then you can get deeper, deeper into it and, and understand it more, even without being a like is a computer scientist or an expert in... and you're not a computer scientist you're I'm you were not. a music major right I'm a music major and then a music business major so yeah i mean i think i always had an interest in um computers and technology because of my dad being at intel and so we got the you know the latest and and you know being a made in the 80s baby it was a technology evolved so interestingly and so quickly made such leaps and bounds that I, you know, I would start my first computer was the home computer where you, you know, dad taught us how to enter DOS prompts, mm -hmm. you know, and there wasn't, Windows was still new. People were barely using Windows 3, 3.1 or whatever it was. And so I've always been interested in it rather than afraid of it. And I didn't ever feel like something was too complicated for me to get, you know, a decent grasp on and see the potential for. So I appreciate that about my uh, my family and the time in which I which I grew up. You know, you start with the with the phone. I mean, my grandparents had a rotary phone. I learned how to make calls on a rotary phone, and now you know I walk around with a hand computer that's yeah. more powerful than the computer that I used in college. You know, <laughs> it's much uh, more. Yeah. Uh, I, I just so you know, yeah, I, 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 when I was a kid, the princess phone had me, which is a, a push button. Yeah. I grew up in rotary phones and uh, I would still go to friends houses as a kid and find phones on the wall with the little thing you take off and talk into the little, co yeah. I, I've actually seen those in use in real life. But again, I grew up in a farm town. So if I walked home from school with the son of a farmer, you know, come, you want to come home and ride horses with me after school, walk into a farmhouse, they still had the phone that Timmy and Lassie used when the show, you know, <laughs> or maybe even the Lone Ranger. I'm not sure. Um, and did right. you have the phrase get so-and-so on the horn? Yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> my, my grandparents, uh, always uh, said that and my my grandpa was a was farm family in texas in panhandle of texas oh the, okay so you, you know what so. i'm talking about but um, trickled down so all right so, so now let's talk about so i'm gonna give a very brief probably somewhat inaccurate description of how pro's calculate what musicians get for their performance royalties they look at slices of markets. They will take, uh, and, and I'm not saying this is ASCAP or BMI or CSAC. This could be 
any PRO in the world, they all kind of operate, at least this part of them operates in a similar fashion, which is they take surveys, samples of, so if something, let's go with a radio station, terrestrial radio station, FM station, pop, and they look at that station and have a box that counts the new Britney Spears single got played 16 times today. It got played uh, three times during morning drive. It got played twice in the middle of the day, which is kind of a dead zone. It got played a few more times uh, for evening drive time, which everybody is a captive audience on the 101 or the 405, at least in LA. And then maybe another spin or two at night. And they total that up and they assign a value to that each of those spins based on market size, audience size, people who were actually listening at the time. And mm -hmm. from that data, they concoct a number, like a, a data point that sets a value. And now they can take that data point and go to a secondary market like St. Louis or Phoenix, a smaller city with a smaller number of people listening. But by mm -hmm. percentage, it might be somewhat reflective of what they saw in New York or LA in a tertiary, the primary markets, I'm sorry, primary markets, secondary markets, tertiary markets. Mm -hmm. So they put all that data together and go, okay, so Britney's single got played X number of times all over America, even though that data was derived from just a couple or a few samples, uh, maybe one at each level, you know, like a primary city, a mm -hmm. secondary and tertiary. So they take that and they determine how much the songwriter is going to get paid their performance royalties based on that number. However, it's a lot of gray area, not an exact science. A lot of it is predictive in nature. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, at the end of the year, there's a little slop, which results in a slush fund of unattributed money that could have been Steph's because she didn't get all the attribution she should have gotten if they counted every freaking spin, which they could do with digital technology in a heartbeat. Absolutely could do. And so Steph gets screwed, I get screwed, all the musicians get screwed a little bit, but screwing everybody a little bit ends up in this nice slush fund at the end of the year. And I think I know what the slush fund does from past friends who've worked on the inside, but I'm not gonna say that because I don't wanna piss off the good people at BMI, ASCAP, CSAC, or any other PRO because some <laughs> of them are still my friends. But in a perfect world, everybody would get paid for every single spin and that's where blockchain could help. So can you explain that? That's where blockchain and AI can help, yeah. I think. Um, Holding hands, baby. So we can't aggregate or sample or record data as human beings as fast as a computer or an AI can. So the fact that one of the main discussions around AI and music isn't being put forth by the PROs to the populace to say, we want to make our process, we want to eliminate essentially you could eliminate surveying. You wouldn't need to survey. You just need to aggregate and collect every information of every actual use. The time period where it's necessary to do surveys because there isn't enough manpower or <laughs> processing power to actually know exactly how many and when that's done. That's been done. So the fact that we're still as, and I love, I love the, the PROs for being there, being themselves and in many ways, making it possible for musicians to earn, to earn money. I mean, imagine any one of us having to go out and individually. Try oh, yeah. to... Couldn't do it. And they bring other, you know, yeah, this is not a put down of PROs. Neither of us are trashing them. We're just wishing that they could use this new technology sooner than later. Yes, because it benefits everyone. It yeah. benefits everyone. It benefits them and the creators and rights holders. Because if you're actually accounting Oops, I just lost you for a minute. I uh, lost your audio. I think your hand might hit your computer and it's... No, I mean, you're, you're talk to me now. I think you're there. Check, check. 
I apologize. I yeah, know. I think when you touch your computer that you hit the, the <laughs> auto level control, you know, it, it saw a spike in level and it dimmed you for a minute. Anyway, you're back. Apologies, I got, I got too Italian. <laughs> <laughs> um, so PROs absolutely need to get in the boat and row, which is my favorite phrase of late because surveys are inadequate and they don't have to be the way that we account anymore. And by utilizing blockchain as well, you could show everyone if, if you think of blockchain as boiling back down to this is a recordation system. This is a ledger that shows you everything that's going on when and who's involved and whatever information you need to know. Now you have a transparent platform, so you don't have any sort of um, conflicts of interest or mistrust, everybody can see this information. And especially if you're using AI to record things onto the blockchain, now there's no room for anything nefarious to go on. It's Or interns leaving something off of the cue sheet. Or human error. Yeah. yeah, or human error. I mean, it's you move a period, you leave off one letter, and now somebody's missing a couple thousand dollars. I mean, it can be some, an error that small that causes a royalty to be missed, to be not collected. I mean, uh, we regularly submit queries to the PROs and go, oh, I don't think this uh, youth got accounted for. I think this was left out of a survey. And a lot of the time, uh, it's a writer or an artist who's aware of a placement that they've gotten and they've gone, you know, I didn't really see that in my latest statement. It, so the, the, the artist or the writer or composer is using TuneFind getting an alert that there was a use, but the PRO is not picking it up in the sample. Right. Okay. And there are, and yeah, exactly. And there are, um, there are companies that have tried to partner with the PROs and to what extent they've employed AI and blockchain, um, I'm not certain of, but like um, TuneSat, there's a, there's a. Oh, that's what I meant was TuneSat, not TuneFind. Yeah, yeah sorry. But, Tune, but TuneFind as well. I mean, it's a place where a lot of cue sheet information gets input and you can ask for alerts, like tell me if my music shows up, if somebody lists this as being in an episode of a show, I mean, the amount of long, long time on task things that this could do to make payments more expeditious, to make them actually fair instead of possibly fair mm -hmm. is, I think it's just, it's, it's something that has to happen. And I'd like to see the you know, music publishers and writers associations really pushing for that because you need a lot of people to make a lot of noise to get institutions that are over a century old to make changes that will take a lot of time and effort to implement. So why, if you, you made the statement earlier that it would be beneficial not only to the creators of the music, but to the PROs as well. And I understand, I mean, it would make their job certainly faster and, and less complex if you had AI doing that collection and, and, or you know data gathering and, and then stored it all on blockchain. Uh, piss off a lot of the staff members who might be out of jobs, but you know, buggy whips. Um, it, it happens. So, how does it benefit the PROs? Because I would think if it benefited them, they would be rushing to the front door to open it and go to work with it. Not, not necessarily. I mean, if there's not enough people within the company or within the organization that can go, look, here's the benefit. We need to do this. Why would they? If, if, if Don't. executive decision makers at ASCAP or BMI or CSAC aren't also, you know, keeping track of every possible way they can implement new and emerging technologies to lessen costs. And I mean, that there's probably somebody whose job is something yeah. related to 
for that, but you still have to convince an organization or an institution to do something new. And the way that you do that is by showing real or very likely potential benefit. Benefits. If you can go to ASCAP and say, or BMI and say, you will reduce administrative costs and be able to put the people that are doing ugh, this kind of administrative work, you will be able to use them in other areas of your company because there's a way to do it without yeah. making it, everyone's got to go. You're going to have to, you know, now you got to reduce staff because nobody needs you anymore. It's, it doesn't always have to to be the case but if you could go look you spend x amount of money on correcting administrative error even let's say that part of that is from people just needing to revise something they submitted if you have technology that's mitigating the amount of human time that has to be spent on that you can sp put humans on other tasks that are creative that are suited to humans rather than putting a lot of your capital and a lot of your time value in the organization into mundane, repetitive things that you will never be able to do as efficiently as Just a computer. imagine a government using it <laughs> for those same purposes. I do. I imagine <laughs> that all the time. It seems like sort of a fantasy utopia, but <laughs> it's- yeah. Wow. Um... A lot of, I mean, the money that they're not paying out in royalties is going to operating costs. The, implementing this technology reduces operating costs because it means you can pay skilled people to do skilled work and not the work that once you've paid a license fee or once you've actually just incorporated something in that a, that a computer will now run and do and take care of for almost no cost once it's implemented. Somebody once told me, somebody who I respect, an intelligent person said to me, the reason that PROs are so hesitant uh, is the same reason that people get paid on quarterlies instead of on a daily basis. Well, on a daily basis, uh, unless you own a small business and deal with credit card fees, you wouldn't understand maybe. Um, but they're transaction fees. Um, and so, yeah, you know, a transaction fee to process 23 cents worth of payment might not be worth the, the price of the transaction fee. However, um, I said, well, okay, so I kind of understand that. And they said, and then there's the float. And I said, what's the float? And they said, well, you understand what a float is in the financial world. And I said, yeah. So for the, I'm going to give my version of what a float is for people who don't watch, you know, any of the financial Bloomberg-y stuff on TV. Float <laughs> is what you do with money that you've collected that's going elsewhere to somebody else, but you're making money on their money by holding on to it for three months or one quarter of the year. So let's say that you've got a PRO that brings in a billion dollars worth of transactions, the, the, the performance royalties total a billion dollars. So mm -hmm. one quarter would be a quarter of a billion or, or no, uh, that's transactions. Um, no, that's dollars. Anyway, the point is that whatever amount of money it is sitting in the bank, their bank for mm -hmm. three months, they might be making a quarter of a percent or a half a percent interest on that money. They might be making, I mean, interest rates are up now. Maybe they're making 5% on that money. So 5% on a quarter of a billion dollars um, is, yeah. is is how much money? 50K? I'm so bad. Half a billion dollars? Uh, Siri? Oh, there you go. Alexa, how much is a quarter of a percent of half a billion dollars? From answers.com. So one quarter of a million dollars is $250,000. She heard, misheard me, it'd be like $250 million. Okay, so that's a lot of money. Somebody once explained to me that's the reason they do quarterly payouts. Um, rather than daily. I'm sure that there are myriad reasons and I'm gonna assume that they're not just evil, but you know, fair enough. I mean, there are the bank, banks make money on the float. There are a lot of companies that make money on, 
on the float. Mm -hmm. And they're not stealing your money. They're not hiding your money. They're just collecting your money. And before that they can do the process of distributing that money in the back end, it takes them three months to do it. And they're making um, maybe as much as 5% in today's interest rates. So that would be a pretty strong motivation for not coming up with a more efficient system for distributing that money on potentially a daily or instantaneous basis. Your song gets used in a soap opera on NBC today and five minutes after that show is over, you hear cha-ching and they're $12.62 in your bank account. Musicians would love that. They would. That, that would definitely make them happy and understandably so. I mean, is there anything worse than waiting for the, waiting for the check that's in the mail? <laughs> <laughs> no. No. No one likes that. No one enjoys that. And so let's say, for example, that that's one of the primary reasons that okay. more expeditious uh, payment process hasn't been implemented. There's certainly a middle ground where it's like, okay, we need some gener We don't want to actually take any of your money of the revenues we're collecting in order to maximize the amount of money we can pay out to you we have to hold it and earn interest on it for this period of time that covers these operating costs that you don't have to now facilitate from your royalty earnings you don't have to subsidize those anymore right uh, from your payout you subsidize them by waiting for your payout so let me make a devil's advocate argument to that that's that's fair and you could take it from three months to maybe one month Maybe there's a, you know, yeah, I'm not looking at their balance sheets or statements of cash flow. So I'm using hypothetical numbers, but there's also, aside from float, the fact of the matter that there isn't any rule or regulation. There is a guideline, <clears throat> and this is based on, this is why we should get rid of um, surveys and cue sheeting in general. There isn't any rule about you have to submit this by this point in time. There's just the recommendation, submit things by this point in time so that you can get paid at this point in time. But PROs aren't going around <clears throat> to NBC and Paramount and going, did you file your cue sheets? Did you tell us what music you used? So that when we survey, we know what kind of payment this should be earning so the fact is that that use that time you heard your song last night yeah that may not show up in the pro's databases that your song was used there for six months right and that's if it's an american use and you're an american uh songwriter god forbid it's in like norway god forbid it's in norway <laughs> you know yeah, the American show airing in Norway. I mean, then it get now we're in the nine month to a year and a half time frame for when the information actually gets to the PRO. And then you got to tie the, the check to the foot of a carrier pigeon and hope it makes it across the Atlantic. <laughs> yeah, send it off. That's weird, little bird. <laughs> um, I just that had is... a, a thought of trying to recapture it. Oh, so if the PROs used blockchain, it created all this hyper efficiency um, and quarterlies were no longer a thing and payments were, let's say, daily. Um, your argument that they use the float to offset their overhead, their general overhead expenses. Um, they also make, what, what does a PRO get? Like 10% for collecting your money, which would seem fair. I, I think it, var it varies slightly from PRO to PRO, but it's not, if it's more than, because, uh, well, BMI has gone private recently, which I know has caused people a lot of concern, but it's not much more than 10% if it is more than 10% of all revenue collected that they then use. Because it's a, I mean, ASCAP still a non-profit organization. So there is a rule about, there are regulations. Right. 
for you can't say you're a nonprofit, but then keep 90% of the money. No, you, know? you could distribute the slush fund at the end to your most often heard legacy writers. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to get into all that. That's, you know, that's yeah. speculative and it's not pretty, but um, okay. So They're going back to my, my use case for one way that you could use blockchain, if, if the float in fact, which is the the money they make in interest payments based on holding on to a big chunk of money for 90 days in a bank account, if that does offset their operating expenses, um, you could also say to people, well, we have a program where you could sign up and get paid daily, but we're gonna take 15%. And that way they can increase the cash flow Mm -hmm. um, and make the system more efficient. And I bet a lot of people would go for that, an extra 5% to get the money in hand, maybe not the multimillionaires who, you know, were sitting there with 20, 30, 50, 100, grand, 100 million dollars in the bank. They don't care if they get it in 90 days or tomorrow. But for a working musician that's making an extra 10 grand a year on sync, they could that's use that. Difference. Yeah, it means you can, you know, pay your bills on time, put food on the table. Yeah, well, not Definitely. at today's prices, but yeah. In a perfect world. In a perfect world. In an inflation free world. Yeah. I drink a vitamin water pretty much every night of my life. I have been for 10 years. Um, I drink like half of it at the dinner table, take the bottle upstairs, put it on the nightstand, and before the evening is over, I will have finished off my vitamin water. At Ralph's grocery store, which is a very common chain for those of us in Southern California, it used to be a dollar. And on a good day, I could buy it on sale for 88 cents. It's now $2.19 for that exact same product at the exact same store. So it's gone up by more than 100%. And yet on the news, they keep saying the economy's getting better. I don't know whose economy they're looking at. <laughs> I know. It's a, and supposedly inflation is slowing, but I, and I, have some interest in finance I'm again I'm, I'm not a financier either but I keep hearing inflation is going down and yet it doesn't look that way so like yeah. things are as expensive or getting more expensive but I don't have significantly more money than I did six months ago you know so it doesn't I'm not sure which which part of the economy they're looking at i mean not the part you put in your gas tank or the part right. that you put in your mouth but um and then in california this is a whole but now we're getting into a whole other I thing mean, but probably qualify california's economy separate right. from everyone else the fifth largest economy in the world by the way but i mean they want us to all have electric cars by 2035 or something but we don't have the electric grid to charge our cars <laughs> And uh, I'm sorry, sure, make an electric car that's affordable for the average person. Well, allegedly Tesla's coming out with a car next year that's going to be under 30 grand. I'll, I would, you know, Elon, make it happen because he said that about the Model 3. And then by the time you got that thing priced and built on the website, the affordable Tesla was $67,000 yeah. or something like that. But the it's prices like, oh. have been coming down on those. But yeah, $30,000 car, and I'm betting you that they're going to design it at the Texas Institute of Technology and Science. <laughs> uh, we can't wait to buy. Yeah. <laughs> I am so anxious to get that hoodie, you know. <laughs> no, I'm not, my wife is going to kill me. She's like, I can't believe you said that on the air. What? <laughs> You gotta laugh. Yeah. You gotta have, can't gotcha. take anything too seriously. Well, unless you have any final thoughts, I think I should wrap this up because we're about a, exactly a minute away from the end of this. But um, yeah, any any final thoughts on either or both of these subjects? You know, I think we hit most of the big concepts, most of the big issues. So I think if if anything, I'm just going to encourage, leave everyone with a encouragement to explore and embrace these technologies as, as much as possible, because I see a lot of potential for them to solve a lot of pain points for musicians and the music industry at large in many respects. So I think the more musicians and creators and that are out there getting on board and getting excited about using these to benefit the creative community, the faster we can 
encourage the powers that be to adopt them and use them to everyone's benefit. I think that your observation that, yeah, lean towards the creative side, but not the replacement side, the tool side, use them as tools. And, and I do agree with you that, um, especially for songs with lyrics, it's got, if chat GPT, even though it's gotten better, uh, and, and it's morphing at an ever faster rate or improving at an ever faster rate. It's gonna be a while before it can write a piece of instrumental music that would make you cry. It may get all the notes in there and the length will be correct and the volume and the mastering may be wonderful, but it won't make you cry. Um, mm -hmm. With that, I bid you a fond farewell and thank you so much. I know how busy you are to take an hour and a half out of your week to do this is greatly appreciated. Uh, honestly, I think we should redo this at the road rally on stage next year. I just don't know how many people, sometimes I do these things that I think are going to be so informative. You would think everybody would want to be in the room. And I look at it, a ballroom with a thousand seats and there are only 212 people in them. But, um, again, humans, a lot harder to predict. Than <laughs> <why>. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. This is really, really good. I enjoyed it. Great seeing you, by the way. And uh, I hopefully we'll get a chance to see you between now and this year's Road Rally because you will definitely be coming Absolutely. back if I have anything to Absolutely. say about it. Absolutely. Ladies Wanna... and gentlemen, Miss Stephanie Reed.